Thank you. Chair Stodal. Present. Vice Chair Laramie. Commissioner Levine. Here. Commissioner Beck. Here. Commissioner Hodgkiss. Commissioner, Commissioner Serfas. Commissioner Cosgrove. Here. Commissioner Palancar. Here. Commissioner Palacios. Commissioner Long. Commissioner Moody. Here. Commissioner Seabrant. Here. Commissioner Gillespie. Present. Thank you. We do have a quorum of six presently. Thank you. Let's then move on to item number two. Uh, regarding our confirmation that we are in compliance with the open meeting law that this meeting has been properly posted. Yes, it has. Great, thank you. Item three, public comment. Comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward and give your name for the record. The amount of discussion as well as the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Uh, general public, any, any comments? on the action items that are on the agenda? Seeing none, hearing none. Uh, also, please let the record reflect. I, we have another commissioner on board. Thank you. Item number four is chair's announcement. I'm simply going to announce that we have a new commissioner with us, or no, uh, another member of the commission on board. Thank you. Other than that, uh, no announcements. Item six, 22-04. Item five, excuse me. We're on item five. You know, I just wanted to move forward, but uh, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, do item five, possible action to approve the final minutes by reference of the regular meeting of June the 27th, 2024. Uh, does the commission have any changes, any comments? Seeing and hearing them, uh, look for a motion. Mr. Uh, Chair, you. before the motion, I think you said 2024 instead of 2022, so just to be clear. And I, I'll make that motion to approve those minutes. All right, we are on, on item uh, number five, uh, and we have a motion to approve the final minutes by reference of the regular meeting of July 27th, 2022. Do we have a second? Uh, I'll second, Commissioner Cosgrove. We have a motion, we have a second. Further discussion? Commission? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously with those in attendance and the chair voting in favor. Now let's move on to item number six, which is 22-0461-HPC1, a report from the assistant principal, uh, uh, Josh Hager, uh, at Las Vegas Academy of Arts, formerly the Las Vegas High School, located at 315 South 7th Street. Dr. Seabrent. Thank you, Seabrent, for the record. So this commission has asked uh, previously for updates on the Las Vegas, um, former Las Vegas High School, currently the Las Vegas Academy of the Arts. And um, the assistant principal, Mr. Hager, is here to give that update, as just to refresh her that everybody knows that we did recently list the entire campus on the National Register of um, Historic Places. And in addition to that, we do have two of the buildings within the campus, the academic building and the gymnasium. Those are both listed on the Las Vegas um, Register. And those are the two buildings that do require their certificate of appropriateness for any type of work. But just a reminder that on the National um, register that is not a requirement and we are here to hear an update on what's happening in the future of the school great thank you I uh, just so I'm clear on that I, uh, uh, we increased the size of the district and that included Fraser Hall what was Fraser Hall not added unilaterally it, it was but it's also included within the district okay so there are three individual buildings then the well but Fraser Hall's not on the Las Vegas um, register it's only on the national. So the only two that are provided the protection are the ones on the Las Vegas register, which is the academic building and the gymnasium. I understand. So as far as the national register, the, the district, the high school district, uh, the historic area has been expanded, and there are the three buildings that are on, if, if I'm not mistaken, and then the two of them are on the city historic register as well. Great. Thank you. I just want to make sure that I'm welcome. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate everybody having us here again. My name is Josh Hager. I am uh, one of the assistant principals at Las Vegas Academy. I have with me Mr. Brian Downey, who is our development director and was a band instructor. 
Uh, we actually both taught at LVA together for many years. Now we have different roles. I have a very brief uh, slideshow that I wanted to, to share with you that is not set in stone, but what it is is the end vision for what we are calling the legacy project, the um, modernization, rehabilitation, and preservation of Las Vegas Academy and Las Vegas High School so that we are preserving history while also making it into a 21st century learning facility. So we call it the Legacy Project. <clears throat> this is a view from uh, basically Clark Street uh, and 9th. Actually, yes, Clark and 9th. And the, what you can see in blue are proposed new structures. Um, the bu buildings that you see that are beige in color are existing structures that will remain at the end of the project. So what we're looking at here, uh, it's, I said Clark and 9th, I'm sorry, it's Clark and 10th Street. Uh, so starting from 10th and the LVA uh, that you can see on the corner there, that's the original vocational building. Um, it, currently, it is a theater and dance classroom space on the east side. The west side also has jazz and guitar classes in it. The difference there is that the add-ons that were put in place, one is a dance studio and the other is what we call our black box theater, are actually removed and vocational is restored to its original look to it. Now, the, with all of these, the interiors of the building are going to be refurbished and refreshed, uh, and we'll get to some of the other ones and, and why that's important. But I wanted to start with this view so you can see that vocational and the original auditorium remain at the end of this project. Um, as you're looking at it to the left of the original auditorium is our Loudon Theater, which I think is this year about 16 years old. 18. 18 <laughs> years old. There you go. When I started there, it didn't exist. Um, next slide. So this is looking uh, north. And one of the changes that's going to happen is that 9th Street becomes an actual uh, learning and pedestrian space in between the theaters with Loudoun Theater on the left and the Performing Arts Theater, the original auditorium, on the right-hand side. Um, Right now, 9th is closed during the school day to through traffic, although that doesn't stop everybody from driving around the barrier sometimes and scaring me and students. Uh, but it's also a place where buses pick up students uh, at the end of the day. If you look at this, you can see the new bus route will actually go through the middle of campus um, with the one entrance and exit being just east of the Fraser Building and the other right out there onto Clark Street. This then looks at 7th and Bridger, again, from an aerial view. There's the beloved main building. At some point, and Mr. Downey and I have discussed this, we know that the color of that building is right now, that kind of rusty brick. I, I was a science teacher at that time. I don't know where that color came from. From what I understand, it was, it was found from a colorized black and white photo. Exactly right. It was it actually wasn't the black and white photo uh, producing what's called a linen postcard, and linen postcard were very popular in the 30s and 40s, right. largely because of the enhancement of the color. It was very bright and, and almost a, a neon color. But that somebody said, "Oh, here's a postcard. That's what it looks like. Paint it." Yeah, that's apparently exactly what happened. Um, as part of this, all of the buildings are going to get an exterior refreshing. That will include paint, but I am not familiar with what color that building was originally. Well, I, I think that, that, that's just... Sold off of the record. I, you know, there's, there's likely somebody at, uh, uh, that I know there is somebody because we use them at KLAS to determine the original paint of the Howard Hughes building. Okay. And so they're able to dig through 20 layers of different paints and find the original color. That's probably uh, what we have. Uh, on but some I of those suspect that there's somebody out there that we would, you would be able to hire to. Okay. To, uh, Wonderful. I, that, I, that's part of it. I mean, we that, I this is my school district, and 17 of them been, have been at LVA, okay. and my daughter went through there. I it is near and dear to my heart, uh, and I love going there every day. So as this goes forward, I too care deeply that these buildings remain, okay. uh, and so. I, this to me is very exciting as I look at it. As you look at this, as you can see the main building and then behind it is the gym. 
Um, the auxiliary structure that was attached to the back of the gym is actually removed as part of this, and that uh, south side of the gym restored to what it looked like in its original structure. Um, Frazier's there as well, wonderfully. I taught in two different, I actually taught in a classroom and in the basement of that building. Um, and it also just gets an in, inside refreshment to make the classroom and learning spaces up to code for one thing, but also just usable, good learning spaces. When I had a, the, the Fraser basement as a classroom, it had one outlet for the entire room. And so I was in violation of every possible code with the power strips and everything I had down there. And those are the kind of things that we are looking at to uh, do away with so that we are in compliance, but also the space is a useful, engaging learning space. Um, <clears throat> what The other things you can see here, just so I can review briefly, there will be an administrative building just um, south of the gym, and that will also allow us to have a single point of entry uh, to the campus, which we still do not have. And if you have followed the news, that it, where schools have gotten into trouble with violence is schools where people were able to enter it either not through the a main door or like us where there's multiple points of entry. So we look forward to having that safety feature in there. Just south of that, the larger building will be the new gymnasium space. Um, the very large uh, building just south of Fraser will be the new student union, which is academic buildings, cafeteria. Um, and then we have uh, the plant, which will be um, all new HVAC systems, centralized networking, everything south of that. And then behind that, just to the south, will be the first ever high school parking garage in uh, in Las Vegas, um, which for us is really becoming necessary as, I mean, on concert nights, we sometimes have all three theaters in operation, and you may have a, it, seriously 1,100 cars trying to park in that area, and they just spread for blocks and blocks out into the neighborhood. Uh, there's an additional uh, music building then to the east, and a new black box will also be installed over there on the 10th Street uh, area. Um, the emphasis here, for me and what I've enjoyed about the whole process is that the history is both preserved and refreshed. Um, it, the gym for me personally is a source of uh, hard feelings because the, the paint is just terrible, it's in disarray. Part of it is because the paint itself has some asbestos in it, particularly on the east side. And so in order to mitigate that, it requires a lot more than just coming in and scraping it off. But the, the fact that we are going to save the frescoes and preserve them and have the appropriate color paint on all these buildings, I think is gonna be fantastic. Um, we have, and Brian has more, <coughs> excuse me, more details about this, but phase one currently has a budget and a, a kind of a scope and goals, um, which would start with um, the plant and the parking garage and the new gym location. Uh, and at the end of phase one, we're actually gonna, where you see the grass field right now, have what CCSD likes to refer to as a portable city. Uh, they are gonna move all the academics at once into that space and including a new cafeteria in that space, portable, so that all of these refreshments and new construction for academic buildings and in Fraser, Maine, uh, the gym later on uh, vocational can occur at once, so it, it, it's gonna be quite a bit of upheaval for our campus, probably for fall of 2025, we will move into these portables, but it makes the whole process then move faster and every, basically everybody suffers in the same way for the same amount of time, as opposed to dragging it out for a long period of time. <clears throat> um, but that basically is, is where they are. We don't expect shovels in dirt uh, till like, January of 24, 2024, parking garage and yeah. the first thing. A couple of, a couple of quick questions. When you say phase one, does that include um, a refreshing the, the main administration building's uh, uh, communication online? I know that that was one of the things that was put off and delayed uh, two or three years ago, and there was a whole that sort of triggered what do we, which, what's our future like? And, right. And, and, so has that, is, is the administration building phase one for communication as well as plumbing, air conditioning? No, my, uh, the phase one would be the new parking garage and the new gymnasium 
and then prepping the portable city so that we could move everybody that's currently in Maine and in Fraser uh, and in Post and Nap into that portable area. So then that refresh would be the next step. So then phase two. Uh, phase two would include refreshing Maine. Uh, but, but on those Fraser. areas of, because right now the communication is less than adequate, is my understanding, in that building? They've done a fair bit when it comes to the wireless networking so that we have internet, the students are able to do um, the work that they need to be doing. Uh, it's a lot of creative uh, band-aiding okay. to work with our current system. Um, as you're probably well aware, one of the larger challenges with Maine is that when you open up a wall, it's a full commitment. And so the, the work that we do to keep the school operational right now right. has to be done very on the surface inside the building. And so that's why they're gonna move us into portables so that they can do all the remediation that needs to be done internally and then run the, uh, the high fiber optics and the, the current technology within that space appropriately um, to make it last the next 90 years. So phase one is roughly start in the next uh, 18 months? That's the plan. If all goes well, this is all with the appropriate permitting, traffic studies, soil studies. Um, the, the district is meeting with um, different, the, the architect and the different uh, contractors to work through the proposal. So right now we're at 15 to 30 percent design okay. on that. Um, but we're working off of the original uh, larger scale, uh, I guess, game plan, as you put it, that was established about five, six years ago right. when we did the original yeah. presentations. And so the, the larger scope of that game plan has not changed. We are, we're merely getting into the, the details of it. Right. Question? Please. Yeah, Jack Levine for the record. The, um, in, in, the, in the overview drawings, you were showing all the new construction in blue, and I assume that that was just to differentiate them. And then on the slide we were just on, we had a big blue monolith building there, and I'm wondering, is like blue tinted glass? Uh, no, no, that, that, uh, I think that's that just merely for what's new versus what's being preserved. Okay, yeah, that's all it is. Yeah. Exactly and and <clears throat> when, when we're looking at the actual ar architectural final design of any of these spaces, that's, that's part of the work between uh, the, the architects, what they're bringing in, and, the, and they're, they're bringing in a uh, combination of recognizing the history, but also what is the modern architectural style. That's one of the, the things we really like about a, a Las Vegas High School LVA is as you see the campus now over 90 years, you have these different architectural times kind of in history. What, what the uh, main building looked like and then the auditorium mm -hmm. and then as they added in, you know, the Loudon Theater is a much more modern looking space, but they'll, they'll all work together as a whole is the intent. All right, good. But I just didn't want to see big blue monoliths. <laughs> no, it, it will not be blue monoliths. Okay. No, it will, it will not. <laughs> no uh, one wants that. I, oh, I'm sorry. I had one more slide that I forgot about. Oh, okay. I, I just wanted to show this to everybody. As you look at this, and again, it's not going to be this big glassine structure. In fact, if you look at the model, it's just blue layers of plastic that, that physically are in place in our library. Straight ahead is actually the Fraser Building, the uh, south side of the Fraser Building. Th they're not removing the doors. They just did not include the doors into Fraser in this rendering. And on the left uh, is the original gym. Um, you can see the steps as they lead up from where that the original ticket office was uh, on the east side of the gym there. Um, so it will. We will have this lovely open quad. You can see the top of Maine over that shade structure. And again, this is this is years in the future. This is probably seven, eight years. And it, it's just an idea. This, none of this is set in stone as far as the final product. Great. Question? I just had a quick question. Uh, the green open space uh, proposed near the new gymnasium, is that going to be programmed open space for like outdoor performances, things like that, or is it for PE? It's, um, it'll be a, a PE field, so gotcha. they'll, they'll have that. Now, there is, and once again, these are ideas, is, is on the parking garage having it set up so that that could be some sort of outdoor, you know, not drive-in, but outdoor theater. You could project onto it and maybe right. the space could be used in different ways, but it, it doesn't necessarily set up for like, it's not open space community access, gotcha. as it were. All right. Thank you.
please. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, thank you. Um, I appreciate this. Uh, Commissioner Levine asked the same question I did. I wanted to make sure we were just looking at footprints and placeholders instead of what the actual structures are going to look like down the road. And I assume you'll be back in front of us so we can take a look, make sure that we are preserving the historic nature of the of, of this property. Uh, I, I clearly remember <clears throat> the flyer that went out when this kind of became public and it showed Godzilla and a bulldozer with main, the main <laughs> building right there. That is not on the table. Good, good. <laughs> My other question is, can you kind of, uh, this is on the financial side of this, I assume there's a strategic plan with a 5, 10, maybe 15 year plan that you're, you're going to start next year. The plan is to begin, but can you just share briefly Reader's Digest version of what that plan looks like? I can't. You've probably, um, you've been in the latest meetings. The, in December, the CCSD school board approved 300 million as part of the bond that was passed in the previous uh, election cycle uh, in December. That, that's what was currently allocated within the next 10 years for this project. Um, looking at rising costs, um, we don't know what that'll do and affect some of the scaling that you see in the programming or if then it will extend into another bond to have the necessary funding to complete the project as it moves on. Uh, phase one that included what we talked about, the estimate so far in the upper 40s to low $50 million range. Um, so that's what we kind of know so far. Nothing has been decided on exactly what this will be, but that's, that's the work the district's doing right now is working with the architect and the, uh, you know, the construction companies to get those bids and get those numbers and the exact pricing. But, uh, the original scope of this project was uh, around $300 million over an eight to 10 year period. And, and we all know how inflation and those things will affect the next 10 years, but that was the mechanism. Does that answer that question? Yeah, it did. And I guess just my quick follow-up would be, is there any plan for private donations to, as part of that? I, I'm sure the school district is open to that. I don't know that they're soliciting that at that point. That's kind of outside of my scope to, to speak to, unfortunately. Yeah, it just seems to me that with the success of the school, the types of students that you're producing, that uh, there would be some benefit from reaching out to alumni and saying, hey, these are some of our plans. Would you like to donate and do some things beyond what you can get even publicly? Absolutely. And I, I'll, I'll bring that forward to the, the district, and uh, I know there's plans and rules about how we would have to go about that and that, those allocations, so, but Thanks. absolutely. A couple of quick questions. Uh, uh, we talked about colors. I, I assume that the, uh, the green for those lawns is just for, uh, that we won't have those kind of lawns in, in the future. Is that correct? I, I would assume that they're gonna put in some sort of water, you know, at, it'd probably be a turf field in that area. Um, it's, it's whatever the district deems is the appropriate programming for PE and what they need in their space is kind of that, where you saw the big green area. Um, right, I mean, I, I'm sure they're gonna the green follow. areas in, in front of the, uh, the historic building, and I would assume that's just there for. Exactly, yeah, yeah, right now that's currently a zero scape sort of area. I think that, okay. yeah, that was just more artist rendering and we're losing the NAP building? Correct. Correct. Okay. It, NAP runs into an issue it's similar to what the, the locker rooms, not the ones that are underneath the gym, but that separate building, in that some of the construction involves that multiple plies of yeah. wood, and it, it's Las Vegas. It has just weathered. Can you throw up the slide that shows the, uh, the, the Loudon and the auditorium? So in looking at the auditorium, is am I missing something? Is this facade different, uh, the front of it? Uh, I don't see the historic markers. Are they going to be gone? Is that part of the plan? This, this, no, this represents uh, TSK's original effort of the game plan back in 2018. Okay. So I don't think it has the specifics of what our current uh, renovation had been after that point to the front. So our intent is to keep that front 
the way it is. Okay. So yeah, the way, it's, the way it was completed about a year and, and a half ago. If they could just sort of update that so I don't get goofy. Uh, just uh, right. Uh, then the last one is, is really wh wh what do you see as the role of, of this commission formally as we move forward with this project? Me personally, I, I, and I'm not speaking, I can't speak for the district. Uh, I'm speaking for a guy who plans on finishing his career at this location. Okay. I am grateful that we can come before you with questions such as, what was the original plan? <laughs> and so as in a consult role, I want everybody here to be uh, informed and so that no one is surprised. And so I think the, the role I see you as is kind of, for me to come in as a check to say, hey, like, this makes sense. And, you know, what we're doing as we move forward is still meeting that goal of preserving, refreshing the history while also creating a campus that, that is a 21st century learning environment. Well, from, from my personal point of view, uh, the Las Vegas, the historic parts of the Las Vegas High School would not be there if it was not for the academy. We would have lost those buildings if we didn't have that academy, somebody making a decision long ago to, to, to turn it into uh, uh, the Las Vegas Academy. That, that provides, uh, to me, the safety net. There's been some bumps in the road, I understand, in the two relationships. Sure. But for me, if we didn't have the academy and its future, the, the historic parks would have a very limited future. So thank you for all the work that, uh, that you're doing. And thank you for your support. Yeah, we, absolutely. We want to honor that history and build the next piece of that history. Great. Questions, comments? Uh, 2025 or 2024, I think you're going to start the I move. That would be, the, the, like I said, the, the parking garage and the gym are the first part of it, which doesn't move, doesn't affect any current existing building on campus, and that's why they wanted to start there, was that doesn't touch anything that exists, so that's January of 2024 with those two structures. And then when we start the rehab of the existing facility would most more likely be fall of 25. That's, you know how these things move, so it, it, could, st it could move out depending on permits and and all zoning and all that sort of business, but um, that, that's the current okay. big picture timeline. Two years or 24 months? I like to think of it as months, sounds shorter. Yeah, right, uh, exactly. Uh, well, I did have one last question, and that is one of the challenges that we've all, we're going through this process is the security of the students. Uh, how is that in the plans as we, as we it, move forward? That's a wonderful question. There is an answer to it. Um, once this is all completely done, and you cannot tell this from the renderings here, because again, this is four years old and it was the TSK architecture firm's basic starting vision for it, but there will be one point of entrance. It will be off of 7th Street. Everything else you will encounter either uh, a, an architecturally pleasing fence line right. um, or the edge of a building. And so we won't have the open nature that we are challenged by now. Right. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, oh, okay. well, there's yeah. always one more last question. Sure. Uh, just uh, have, having just watched on a daily basis the reconstruction on the old Gorman High School lot, I'm, I'm shocked at how fast you guys can put a school up. All right. <laughs> and how everybody loves the colors, loves the shapes, loves the architectural design of that. I don't know fitting that in with into the campus, something similar to that, like you're doing in some of the new schools. But um, but I, I hope you'll you know really really be sensitive to something that, that matches and, and complements the historic that we're trying to save. So, right. I, 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 I think we are all in agreement that it does have to flow that way. It's not yeah. all going to look like it's Art Deco, but right. um, at the same time, it, if it really did look like what I'm presenting, it, that would be an eyesore beyond <laughs> forgiveness. Yes. Um, and so as those, and it, it, the other thing is that while TSK was kind of the mother architect for this, each phase actually brings in additional architects for that particular phase. And so right. at no point will those plans or anything, you know, kind of be done in secret. Um, right. it, it, it will, there'll be time for public comment. 
and look at it. Yeah. That's great. All right. Again, thank you very much, and look forward to uh, to the next update. Uh, hope it's uh, less than 24 months away. So we we'll appreciate your time and yeah. your effort. No, thank you thank very you much all. for having us. Appreciate it. You know where we are if more questions come up. Down the street. <laughs> thank you. Move on to item number seven, which is 22-0462-HPC1, discussion for possible action regarding the approval of $600 in Historic Preservation Commission funding for members of the commission to attend the November 1st through the 4th, 2024 National Trust Preservation Leadership Forum. Uh, Dr. Seabrand. Thank you, uh, Seabrand, for the record. So this is, uh, pass forward, this is the uh, conference that we did attend last year and they are offering it again online this year. So that means that everybody can attend since it doesn't um, entail any travel anywhere. So I just want to uh, look at a few slides to let everybody know what is going to be offered during this uh, conference. So the themes are historic preservation is climate action, encouraging inclusion and diversity through preservation and understanding preservation's role in real estate development. Now that's a very broad um, example of, of the types of sessions that will be offered and then just under each one of those I just put a little um, title of some of the, the sessions that they are offering. I think for our purposes, the, the climate action, since obviously we do live in a very dry um, climate that some of those would be good for this commission to understand is how that affects buildings and how we can do our job. Um, inclusion of diversity through preservation. Um, a lot of issues as far as like we're with our surveys of addressing minority issues in underrepresented communities and how we can encourage preservation through um, our African American neighborhoods, our uh, Latinx neighborhoods, um, our neighborhoods that are again underrepresented in preservation uh, planning. And then understanding preservation's role in real estate development and we're also gonna talk about that at our next item, so stand by for that. Again, something that is um, important to this commission. One of the sessions is going to be about affordable housing, but there's also a more on how to deal with affordable housing, um, infill housing, development, and all of you can actually find all of the sessions. They are in the backup material if you want to see what every single one is. Mm -hmm. And in, in addition to the conference that is held the first through the fourth, there will be uh, on-demand sessions that will begin in October that once we uh, register everybody, then everybody will get an email that says you can attend these sessions that are meant to be sessions that will give you good background and some, as it said here, some foundational information for what will be presented at the November uh, conference. And in addition to the, pr the pre, <laughs> conference videos, there will also be, all of the sessions will be available for three months after the conference ends. And so that means that even if you are not free November 1st through the 4th and you can't attend these sessions, as long as everybody signs up, then you can still find time three months after November 4th in order to watch the, um, the sessions. And they all, all are available, of course, on any of your um, devices that you can, your phone, your computer, your laptop. And the sessions do start at 1 p.m. Eastern time, and that's Eastern time, we are three hours behind that, but they do say that that is subject to change because they have not finalized the, the actual agenda, so sometimes maybe changing of when they're gonna be offering the sessions. And so we do get a discounted rate if we register prior to September 26th, and that is uh, because we are members of, of this um, uh, commission. Um, it's $260 plus $90, well, for the first 10, and then $90 for additional members. And so we factored in uh, having all the commissioners plus staff attend these sessions. And all we need is, if the commission does agree to this, we will need to use HPC funding of, and again, it depends on how many commissioners from that two, we will have to spend $260 and how many commissioners beyond that will actually be attending. So I'm happy to answer questions. I think uh, with uh, the dollar figure of 600, you uh, 
uh, have answered my question, but this does include members of the staff that are going to be able to attend, correct? Yes, correct. Great, okay. Questions? Comments? Um, I think that the, the last time around these were extremely valuable uh, and, and very helpful, and, and these are not uh, some sort of dreamland, uh, a perfect world. These are reality uh, uh, seminars dealing with real issues and with real solutions, uh, real, real opportunities for solutions. So I, I think we should just direct uh, uh, tell you whether or not uh, you well what we'll approve. need if the commission just wants to approve this item then we will need to know who wants to attend just let Teresa and I know okay. I put my name on the list I want to attend and then we'll submit everybody's names and we it would be good to have that at least a week prior so September 19th September 20th at the very latest but if you know you want to attend now we'll put you on the list do we, uh, uh, first of all, uh, let's uh, take a motion. Uh, I, would, I would move to approve the $600. The Jack will sign for the record. We have a motion, we have a second. Uh, further discussion by the commission on approval. All those in favor say aye. 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 Do I take names now? Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously with the chair voting in favor of the those in attendance and I think Commissioner Line asked, can we give you the names now? You can, or you can just email us um, if you want. Is well, you want to let us know now? That's fine. Down. I'm there. Mia. Okay. Mia says yes. Is, well, let me just do it this way. Is there anybody on this commission right now that uh, doesn't want to attend? So I think you can put us all down. Okay, uh, and then we'll reach out to the other members. Right. Okay, Great. perfect, thank you. All right. Let's move on to item number 822-0463-HPC1, report by the Department of Planning regarding an update on the Strategic Neighborhood Outreach Program. Dr. Zebran. So we're going to do this in kind of two parts. Um, Director Floyd is going to start this out and then I'll come on the second part. And just to remind everybody, this is the strategic outreach that we have been trying to do since um, COVID kind of has let us get into the neighborhoods again and how we are addressing um, people understanding that they live in historic neighborhood and what they need to do as far as any improvements or changes to their property or their houses and then um, as far as people that are buying historic property of what that means and that's where um, Seth is going to jump in. Uh, thank you Mr. Chair. Uh, Seth Floyd for the record um, and Diane took some of my intro there but this stemmed from some direction well an idea that you all had and then some direction that you gave us uh, over the last few months and it's an idea that I think has been culminating over the last few years which was and maybe it was really a question, how do we let people know that they live in a historic neighborhood? Uh, and we've thrown some ideas around. I think I reported to you either last, last meeting or the meeting before that what we had worked with our GIS team to come up with a way that we can track new home sales uh, and get that report on a periodic basis and then draft a letter or a packet uh, for those new homeowners letting them know uh, or sending them some glossy materials, letting them know where they live, the importance of that, and some of the rules that go along with living there and some of the responsibilities. So uh, Diane and her team, uh, Teresa and Mark House on our GIS team, have come up with over the last six months, and I don't know if we can put this up on the screen here. I can just show these real quick. Um, we have, let's see, two, four, six new home sales in John S. Park over the last six months and four new home sales in Beverly Green. Um, so we'll be getting a document, let me get that out of the way so it'll focus. We'll be getting a document like this that we can pull every three months, every six months, every year, whatever interval uh, we want to do uh, so that we can identify those new home sales and send a letter which was just on the screen before I put this one up. It's a draft letter that, that, that Diane has come up with uh, to send to those homeowners identifying who she is, uh, what district they live in, where they can find materials, and then outlining a few of the uh, advantages of living in those communities and also the responsibilities that go 
along with it. Uh, and in just a, a minute, I'm going to turn this over uh, to Diane uh, to talk about the guide that she has also put together with some, it sort of reads like an FAQ uh, of questions that folks might have when they move into these neighborhoods. And, and the goal here is to try and avoid some of the things that you all hear from time to time, which is somebody builds something, they don't realize they need to come to HPC, maybe they didn't even realize they needed a building permit. We're trying to head some of that off in advance so they go through this in the right order. If they want to do something, they get the approval first, and then they go do it. Do it. It's better for the city. It's also better for the homeowner who doesn't spend all that money only to have to take something out later. So um, we haven't sent out our first round of letters just yet. Uh, so no data to report on what kind of feedback we're getting. Uh, but this is moving along very nicely. I, I'm excited that we're able to do this because, as I said, this is something you all have been asking us about for a long time. And you know, we were finally able to get creative enough to figure out a way to resolve that issue. And I'm happy to answer any questions about, about that. And then I wanted to introduce, it. before I turn it over to Diane, I wanted to introduce Tyrone Perryman. Uh, we had told you that another part of our strategic outreach, and Tyrone, if you want to come up and introduce yourself, uh, was to realign the way that we do code enforcement in the historic west side, I'm mean, sorry, in the historic <laughs> districts, uh, John S. Park, Beverly Green in particular. We've done some neighborhood meetings there. A lot of code enforcement issues have come up. Uh, Tyrone has recently been assigned to this area, uh, and, and the, the, the directive Tyrone has been given is to, is to learn what the historic district is, uh, do outreach, and he will be your point of contact. We get a lot of neighbor uh, complaints and concerns and comments uh, as things are going on in the neighborhood. They're a very active, engaged neighborhood, which we love, but we wanted to give them a dedicated point of contact, someone who's going to be paying more attention to that neighborhood. Now, I want to be clear, though, code enforcement, because of staffing resources, we're not uh, proactive generally. We have a few proactive programs, but we're mainly complaint-based. Uh, but one of the things we're focused on over the next year or two as we add staffing, is doing more of the outreach components so that even though we're complaint-based, we have more of a connection to some of these communities where we know we're seeing issues and we're getting a lot of the phone calls. So uh, Tyrone, if you just want to introduce yourself real quick. Of course. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen of the uh, commission. My name is Tyrone, as I've said. Uh, my last name is Perryman. You can call me Ty if you'd like. Uh, I am the new code enforcement officer for the east side of, the prop, uh, of Las Vegas. Um, I have been in Las Vegas for roughly seven years, almost eight here now. Um, so I haven't had the opportunity to see what most of you may or may not have seen over there uh, as far as some of the historical buildings or what it used to be at a point. But I have had a chance to see what it is now. Um, so I did want to come and just kind of save face and uh, let you guys, as Seth said, put a face to the name when you guys do see those. Uh, properties out there that do have those cases and uh, be able to help the community to uh, pretty much kind of um, get a grab on their concerns as far as uh, the homeless or uh, as far as the non-permitted buildings or additions or structures or for the purpose of these meetings with these certificates of uh, appropriateness. You know, um, I want to make sure that we all can come together and uh, basically um, gather one common goal to, you know, um, actively support each community and um, make the east side as best as it used to be. That's all. Uh, welcome, Guy. Thank you. Uh, question? Yes, Palancar for the record. Um, I know Diane's coming up, but are we going to be able to include with that letter the actual map of the historic district because it's cut up and not everybody's really in it that's even close to it. In fact, I think one of our uh, residents that uh, was considered non-contributing uh, went out looking for a specific type of fence they should put up and they went all over the neighborhood. Well, naturally they saw all the neighborhood and not just the historic district. So they picked a fence that realistically wasn't a historic uh, or from the district. So I think it's still confusing unless we give them the perimeters of where the actual district starts and ends, who's contributing, who's non-contributing. Gets very confusing otherwise. 
Yeah, so I'll, I'll, let, when Diane, I'll let Diane speak to what she is planning to put in there, but I, I don't see any reason why we couldn't put a map. There is a link, though, that she has in her letter that takes you to the listing of historic, historic districts. So if when you got the letter, you could, it would be quick and easy just to take and a And it's been updated? The map is up to date as far as I know. We'll check on that and make sure, but as far as I know, it's up to date. Does it show the specific homes that are contributing versus non-contributing? Uh, see, but for the record, no, we don't have that specific information in there. But to answer your question about what is in the packet, so it's not just the letter. They will be sent the letter. They will be sent the map. And again, this letter just goes to people in the historic district. So this isn't letter is not going to go to somebody that's not in the historic district. In addition to um, the packet that we will be sending them with the letter with the map, also our brochures that says what it means to the benefits and the incentives of living in a historic district and of course guidelines of what they need to do in order to um, apply for certificate of appropriateness. It'll be, this is just one piece. Thank you. I, I think that map is, is, is really helpful to show mm -hmm. the parameters. I could get the map because I'm in the district, my next door neighbor or the person behind me may not get it. Uh, uh, and so just, just a quick question. In driving through recently, every week, the Biltmore District and or the Huntridge area, the World War II housing, those streets are just dramatically and significantly smaller. Their width is just, I'm not sure how it was, was approved maybe with wartime. Are there any specific rules where the width of the street plays into what you can do with your home? I'm thinking of turning garages into living spaces and therefore they have to park on the street. Is the width of the street as part of any equation no. in making decisions? So I'm not aware that the width, it does play into making decisions on parking because obviously you still have to have traffic flow. Right. Um, as far as what you do on your site, that would be governed by whatever the setbacks were for that, and we could take a look at those districts, but that would be governed by whatever the setbacks were. But whether you were allowed to, say, convert a garage isn't tied in our zoning code to the width of the street. Now, it may, of course, as you point out, if, you've, if you don't have enough room in the driveway to park, you convert your garage and you're parking on a street that's too narrow, you may create a traffic issue um, that parking would have to address. But the zoning code doesn't directly tie those two together. And we do have challenges. Uh, the, all of, the, of East Las Vegas, which we're doing a master planning effort in a good chunk of that right now, there are streetscape challenges. There's a number of those streets also that don't have curb and gutter or sidewalks. Right, right. And that's a neighborhood that, that folks actually walk more than in some other neighborhoods in the city, and they don't have the infrastructure to do it. So we are looking at those streetscape issues, right. but there's not really a direct link between what you're allowed to do on your property, which would be set by the zoning code, and the width of the street and what's allowed on the street. Uh, and I won't belabor the point because we need to move on, but uh, uh, in, in driving through the Huntridge, uh, I kept my speed limit at 10, 12 <coughs> miles an hour just because you're sort of weaving in and out. And it is, But there were cars that were going the speed limit 25 miles an hour. So I'm wondering whether or not that can be addressed in some way with uh, reducing the speed limit in residential areas that are historic or the street. But that's, that was the extent of my thinking. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can certainly raise that with Public Works and see, I mean, they, they're constantly adjusting and readjusting speed limits. They just did a study on Charleston to figure out if that speed limit needed to be adjusted. We could certainly do it there, too. Great. Dr. Seabrand? Oh, I'm sorry. Jack, did you have a question? Um, Jack Levine, for the record. I, um, I had attended both of the meetings, the Janice Park and the uh, Beverly Green meetings that we had. They were very well attended. We had lots of people at both. Uh, uh, I was real pleased to see. Uh, a couple of things that were uh, that, that I think would be helpful is that an initial letter like this one, which I think is intended on congratulating on buying your house last week, but a, a, a first shot at it to all the addresses in the two districts is not that many houses altogether uh, with, with that information, and then following up with every new transfer of ownership. All right, so it doesn't just begin with the transfer of ownership. Let's get it out to everybody right now when we get the brochure finally finished. And with, the, with a copy of the brochure for their realtor for when they're ready to sell, let's just get that information out there to all the different people. Um, one of the other things that was really raised a lot at um, the last meeting uh, was that uh, there was 
a request that isn't there some way that we could record on the, the title that this home is in a historic district. I mean, we've got easements for, you know, navigation to fly overhead. We've got easements for the utility companies. We've got, all right, it should be a recorded thing that's going to be on the preliminary title report that's going to be obvious to somebody when, when they're ready to transfer their title. There's going to be a title report, and it's going to be there. All right, so that, that was one of the things. I don't know how hard that would be. Yeah, to do we'll, that. we'll write that down. I'll, I'll, that may be a question for the city attorney's office. I mean, we don't we don't record on each parcel the zoning code, for example, and that's where these obligations come from. Um, and so I'm not sure if that's something we could or would want to do. But yeah, we, but they also don't know. The but they code. also don't know that there's a zoning code yeah. in many issues. Well, that, that, that's, know, that's true. That's or true. a building code. So let's let them know. Yeah. You know. Uh, but, but an initial letter right off the bat, and then every time there's a new transfer, they get it as well, uh, is my recommendation on that. Yep. And uh, uh, really glad to see this Realtor 1. That'll be put in the Realtor <laughs> 1 will be put into a, an actual brochure format, not a stapled yeah. exactly. prototype. Can you get, kind of go over that, uh, uh, your part of the presentation? Yeah, so I was going to say, maybe that's a good time, uh, Mr. Chairman, for me to turn this over to Diane for her to go over the other right. piece of it. Thank you. Great, thank Welcome. you. Okay, thank you, Seth and Ty. Um, yes, so see for the record. So the second part of this strategic outreach update is the outreach to the real estate world. And we do rely heavily on Commissioner Levine for um, input on this. So there is a, everybody received a copy of the Realtor's Guide Selling in a Las Vegas Historic District. Again, this is not written in stone. This is, you can give us your comments, give us your ideas. This is just an idea of how we get the information out to all of the realtors that are potentially selling in the historic district. And it's just real basic information, like what is a historic property? What is a historic district? Not everybody obviously is aware of that. Um, why owners need to be aware of purchasing historic properties. Again, talking about our municipal code, um, Title 19, that does protect our historic properties. Um, what it means to purchase historic properties. And again, all of these slides are you have in the document in front of you. Um, as far as you know, why it's important to keep our history. Um, we have, and then I think these are the most important parts, and this is what a realist state agents can do. And Jack, I'd love your feedback on this. Um, so first is to consult on with our online map. So our online map does tell you if it is in a historic district. Um, contact obviously our office with any questions. And I do have several realtors that do call me periodically asking if the house they're selling is in a historic district. Obviously inform potential buyers and sellers if they are per selling or purchasing a historic listed property. Um, obviously tell the potential buyers about our grants program, our bricks and mortar program, that that is an incentive to, to buy that historic property. And obviously to contact us um, if they're gonna sell a property and then they we can make sure that we can get uh, our welcome packet to the, the new owners. And what we can do is obviously we provide guidance, we um, provide consultation, we provide informative literature, we make sure that people are aware of our local ordinances. Um, we also are there to help people with uh, their completion and submission of their certificate of appropriateness as well as their grants. And be here for any type of additional information, uh, questions they may have uh, re uh, regards to um, historic preservation. And then, of course, we do have what is the Historic Preservation Commission, and this is just a brief little paragraph about the establishment of this commission in 1991 and, and what its purpose is in the city to preserve, obviously, our historic properties. And then we do just have a little information about our bricks and mortar projects that does um, offer up to the $10,000 matching grant for the repairs on their historic properties. And um, like I said, take this home, go over it, um, let us know your feedback. The one thing I did, a question for um, Commissioner Levine is, is there like a real estate magazine or something that we could place an ad in to promote this? Or um, I would love to hear your feedback on how we really get this out to that community. I know in the, uh, you had previously mentioned the 
is it the board, the board of realtors, is that what it's called? So I would love for you to give your feedback, please. Excuse me, your mic. Your mic. All right, so the board of realtors said, prepare something to show us, okay, as opposed to we started first with, can we promote something? They said, show us, give us something then we'll decide whether we can promote it or not. So this is the material that's being drafted for that purpose. Um, the, uh, there are real estate magazines that go out, but they're mostly ego fluff pieces uh, type magazines uh, where you can actually take out you know, a three page article on yourself uh, with photos of, uh, with your f fist on your chin or whatever they do, you know. Uh, I hardly ever look at them. I mean, they're, they're fluff pieces and ego pieces. So I, I don't know that we're going to reach a, a really big, broad audience on that. Um, the, the, the one main magazine that gets read is the, is the national real estate magazine, but that's a national one. So Well, are there place. online websites? Maybe I'm showing my age there by talking yeah. about printed material. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, if there's like an online forum. The, the best way for us to reach everybody is to, get, is to do it through the Las Vegas Realtors, you know, as messages of the day, as a, uh, as a, as a one hour lunch and learn type class that gets promoted and broadcast and I think that's going to be our best approach to reach the most number of people is programs like that. And would you have the contact for the Las Vegas Realtors that um, we could reach out to for this? Yes. Okay, if you could send that to me and Teresa, that'd be great. I think right. that's a fantastic idea. All right, good. Any other questions? Uh, just to real, uh, and I think we can just send you anybody that has any any comments on this. But well, does the Centennial Commission? I thought that they also had. Excuse me, grants. Chair. Yeah. Could you please? Uh, Stole all for the record that grants were available by the Centennial Commission for historic preservation. Th they can as well. Yes, they can apply for a Centennial Commission grant. Yes. I think we could add, add maybe add that to this as well. We can. Okay. All right. And another thing I just thought of is maybe we could actually do a. A sample disclosure form that you should get your buyer to sign. And you, you realize that uh, the same way we do for homeowners associations, okay? Did you know form? Uh, if you're going to buy this house, sign here that you you, you acknowledge up front. Because I think if, if we do this really really well, we may there may end up being some lawsuits against real estate agents for you didn't tell me. All right, so let's let's create a disclosure that as a sample. Okay, that they can put on their own letterhead and have their buyer sign off on it. That we recommend that you disclose this properly as, as part of your sales contract. Well, I think there's several opportunities, several pathways to move forward to get this message yeah. out. And, uh, just a, a quick comment as to why uh, what, it would be helpful, I think, that if we were to include the state and national register information uh, uh, even though this is certainly the city of Las Vegas, we're focused on that, but I think it would be helpful just to add those those two and, and, may, and certainly maybe we just say that clearly the city doesn't enforce those or they're not, uh, but they do exist and they are important and, and they do cover several of our key neighborhoods. I, I, something I think we should have in there to address that issue. Questions? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I just wanted to thank uh, Diane and Seth and Ty uh, for all your efforts here. It's really great to see uh, some outreach and implementation of our historic des district uh, designations in the community. So great work. Keep it going. And we're just here to fine tune. So thanks again. Great. All right. Any other questions, comments? Please, go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Chair, just to follow up to Commissioner Levine's uh, comment. I. I think that's an excellent idea to uh, ask the HOA as part of the disclosures um, to acknowledge that the oh. homeowner, uh, the new homeowner, has received some type of notice. We could then go back to the HOAs and say, hey, it's really important that maybe the front page or second page of your documents discloses that this is a historic neighborhood and there are certain obligations that come uh, along with that. I, I think that's terrific. All right.
Well, we don't have any HOAs that are, but but in the similar context, that's it, what we do for HOAs. So I agree with you there. Well, maybe then the the organization uh, yeah. uh, could could do something similar to what an HOA. Right. Would I mean, John do. S. Park does have some or, some organization. No, we have a neighborhood association. There's a neighborhood association, but that's not a homeowners association. There's no membership requirement. There's no dues. There's no obligations other than the, what comes from the historic district. And like the John S. Park neighborhood, only a, a portion of it is actually in the historic district, which also begs the question of how do we expand these districts so that all of John S. Park is part of the historic district as opposed to just north of Franklin or Beverly Green, uh, everything south of St. Louis is not a historic district. So let's, but that's Beverly Green Associ Neighborhood Association. So it's also something we could work on within the city to maybe divide out those neighborhoods, you know, the historic districts from the other ones or something. Um, so I, I don't know, that's, uh, that's, that's a bigger phase three. So does the city, do we have a, an easy access, maybe it's a question for Seth, of the existing historical or not, homeowners associations, do they have to register with the city, HOAs? <coughs> yeah, so Mr. Chairman, we, we have a listing of the formal HOAs um, because we provide notice to them uh, of certain planning applications. We also are, well, it's now called the Department of Neighborhood Services, keeps a list of all the informal neighborhood associations as well, so those groups like uh, Buffalo Coalition, Rainbow Family Park, John S. Park. I mean, they're, they're all, they're not HOAs, but they're neighborhood associations. We have a list of those as well. Okay. All the registered ones, I should say. And, and then, and then to, to sort of change it from that a bit, the, the management groups that manage some of the smaller HOAs? So our point of contact for each of those, for the, so for the, the HOAs, we would have whoever's listed as their contact. Now, I don't know if they're up to date or if they include their management company or if it's an individual. For the neighborhood associations on their applications, they're required to list their, uh, I think they have to have two, two folks who are points of contacts. Now, those more than likely have a high chance of being out of date because if, if they're not an active neighborhood association, they may not update those, but um, we, we would have all of that contact information if it's up to date. I'm not sure the path that I'm going down other than I'm starting with the idea that many of these uh, uh, neighborhoods that have associations are getting past being 50 years old. And while they may not be on the register, uh, and that's where the end of my thinking was, I didn't go further than that, but that's, thank you for your... On a related note, Mr. Chairman, so when we did the uh, survey catalog, uh, we... I think Diane showed a slide when she gave a report on that. We graphically showed where all the neighborhoods are that will be, that are either at 50 years or will be at 50 years. I think we did 10 years and then 20 years out. I can't remember how far we went out, but we are tracking, you know, at those new neighborhoods that will come online, say, in the next couple of years. Um, and, then, and we could certainly start a program of reaching out to, if, if they have a neighborhood association, reaching out at that time. I think the idea of having communication with the association is, is a good communication device. So, further questions, comments? Yes, Palancar, for the record, just to go back to Tyrone, um, he, you are now the uh, officer that would be directly related to the John S. Park District. That's who we call in John S. Park, or do you also cover Beverly Green and all of them. I mean, we we need a direct contact because just calling the code enforcement doesn't get us ahead. It would be nice to so have can your you, can you direct maybe line jump or in the proper the best procedure. Yeah. So um, what what I can do for uh, Commissioner Palancar is I'm as long as Tyrone is willing to give her his work cell phone, um, he, can, he, can, he can provide all of you with his work cell phone so that you can uh, contact him. He's not exclusively John S. Park, but his area, that we've, we've changed our areas. I believe it does include Beverly Green, and, and it's a good chunk of East Las Vegas. So I think it's, it's the Huntridge, too. Is that right? Yeah, so it's, it's several neighborhoods that all have similar issues in the area. And that was on purpose, because we, 
one of the comments we heard from you all was that you you wanted someone who could really get to know right, the exactly. area because they're unique. I mean, there's some unique issues in the older areas, particularly the ones with a historic designation, and that's what Ty has been tasked with uh, getting up to speed on the issues in, in those communities. But I, we can get you a map, and he can get you his contact information after the meeting. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Further questions, comments? Let's move on then to uh, 9, which is 22-0464-HPC1. This is a report by the Department of Planning regarding an update on an appeal of the denial by the HPC of a request for a certificate of appropriateness for the installation of the hot tub and shower and surrounding privacy screenings at 700 Park for sale, Dr. Sebring. Thank you, Sebring, for the record. So I'm not sure if anybody was able to watch the um, city council meeting where this was discussed, but there was a long discussion about if it was appropriate or not and if the city council would um, approve or deny their um, appeal. And unfortunately, my only update is that it was obeyed until September 7th. So we will address this again at the September 7th uh, city council meeting. Was there any question regarding the presence of the, the commission or you representing the commission? Did anybody ask about it? Yeah. No, I was there representing everybody. Okay, great. Thank you. All right, let's move on then to item 10, 22-0466-HBC1, report for the Department of Planning regarding the director's update. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Seth Floyd for the record. So I, I actually incorporated the update that I had as part of agenda item number uh, eight, so I have no further updates. All right, questions? Then let's move on to 11. Excuse me, Chair, your yes. mic, please. Your mic. Well, my voice carried. Uh, let's move on to 11, which is 22-0467-HPC1, report for the Department of Planning regarding the project update list. Dr. Sebring. Thank you, Sebring. For the record, so uh, for the this commission's uh, projects, we do have the West Side survey. It is in progress. For our Char Charleston Heights survey, that one is also in progress. We will have a neighborhood meeting that is scheduled for October 12th. Uh, at 6 p.m., sorry, I failed to put the time on there, uh, at Charleston Heights Arts Center, and that's located at 800 Brush Street. So everybody is invited to attend that. We'll make sure, obviously, to send out flyers and emails to everybody uh, so they know to show up for that. The Rafael Rivera Historic Context and Reconnaissance Survey, so the RFP is out, and the proposals are due actually tomorrow. So we'll see how many uh, proposals we do get in by um, the, the, I believe that the contracts have the cutoff date sometime in the afternoon. For the design guidelines update, I will have more on that at our September 28th meeting, uh, as well as demolition ordinance update. I know that those two are items that have been asked about in the past. Just to understand that it takes a while to gather this information and uh, make sure that we have everything that we need to provide this commission with an appropriate update. So that will be on our September 28th up, uh, meeting as well. Uh, just a uh, side note, Nevada Preservation Foundation. Now, these are Centennial Commission projects, but I know that this board is interested in these, and that's the Biltmore Bungalows. And yes, Chairman, I know it's not a bungalow. That is the name that we are, are plagued with right now. Um, in the revolving fund, they are both in progress and they are delayed. However, the uh, uh, Nevada Preservation Foundation will be giving updates on those at the September 29th Centennial Commission meeting. So if anybody's interested in hearing that, you can um, attend those meetings as an audience member or you can obviously tune in on online. And then, oh, this is the important one. Oh, Seth, I should give this to you. Good point. I should have added this on my uh, update. So as of Monday of this week, the council voted last week. I think we may have mentioned this uh, in a prior meeting, but uh, we are no longer the Department of Planning. We are the Department of Community Development. And the change is that we are, have now combined with building and safety. So all of the de essentially all of the development services, so planning, building and safety, business licensing, code enforcement, 
are all in one division. Uh, so if you see any correspondence from Diane or from any of us, you'll see that it says Department of Community Development. Should, should not have any effect on you all. Diane is still the Historic Preservation Officer. Um, she's just in a different department. So I don't think you'll see much of a change, but um, it is an effort to try and bring all of our development services under one roof to provide better customer service to uh, the public and particularly the, de the development community. Thanks. Mr. Chair, through you, can I just make a comment? Please. Uh, Seth, I think that's great. And uh, with uh, you in that role, hopefully we'll see some more collaboration with the other departments. Uh, and I'm just going to pick on the old demolition permit issuance uh, type of uh, uh, issue we've faced in the past. So that's great news. And hopefully there'll, there'll be some more communication and uh, coordination on some of these issues that we face here. Thank you. Um, Quick question, Jack Levine, for the record. Where is uh, where is all of this big new division going to be housed? Uh, <laughs> where are you working? Where, where's the, the million office? dollar question? Um, so no one is moving physical locations at this time. Uh, we are we are all staying where we are. So building and safeties, we're all a little bit spread out right now. When we left the development services center, we uh, kind of got brought. Some of us got brought back to city hall. We have. Some of our field team is in uh, the East Yard and the West Yard. In fact, I just got a tour of our materials testing lab uh, this morning at the West Yard. Uh, so that's not going to change in the near future. However, we are building a civic plaza across the street, which you may have seen in the news. That is expected completion, I believe, end of 2024. Uh, and at that time, some of the departments from City Hall will move, and there may be some shifting around. But as of right now, nothing is changing about where we're located. None of our phone numbers change, none of our emails. Uh, so, so it's, it's yeah, all going to be the same. I didn't even know where, when you closed the, the 333 Rancho building, where, where did everybody go? I didn't, I didn't know that. So, so uh, most of the core services are here in City Hall. So building and safety, admin, code enforcement reports here, light business licensing, planning. We're all, we're all in this building. Different floors, but we're all in this building. All right. Uh, still going for the record. Seth, uh, one of the things, and uh, Diane brought it up, uh, one of the panel discussions that uh, is coming up in November, and there have been several over the last couple of years is the impact on climate change on historic preservation. Where within, is that climate change or the environment, is that a department within the community development? So I, I'd, I'd say the, the quick answer is yes. We have uh, a sustainability team that's part of planning. Um, that's moved around a little bit, but it's, it's housed with us now. Um, and I would say if there's a team that's specifically focused on climate change, that would be it. I mean, our master plan that we adopted for 2050, our 2050 master plan, really puts that responsibility on everyone. So I mean, all of the departments have some role to play in addressing various issues of climate change. But we do have a sustainability team that's specifically focused on those issues that is housed in planning. It's Mar Marco Vallada is the lead of that team. Uh, I don't know if he's ever presented to HPC. He's presented to HPC before, yeah. He's, he's, he's in charge of implementation of our master plan. He oversees that effort. Uh, and he's, our, he's the lead of our sustainability team. And, and of course, I mean, the challenge is we know we're moving forward. Historic preservation is, is not just architecture. Historic preservation is cultural, uh, uh, historic events and those kinds of things. But it's also the, the living environment, and, and that is clearly changing. 1950s, there was a big debate within the city commission about uh, conserving water. And the decision was, no, we're not going to conserve water. We're going to find new ways to drill wells so we can have more green grass. Um, so the elements of, of some of the historic preservation of green lawns uh, even though they may be 50 years old, those are going to disappear. So there is some overlap on some of these things that would, ch at least would, I think could, we should be informed about or, or have the opportunity to be at least part of the movement forward with uh, the changes in, in, in uh, uh, how we develop properties and, and how we preserve existing properties because of climate change. If there's a, something in there you can figure out, appreciate it. We'll work on that. Thank you. Uh, Diane, anything further? No, that's okay. All right. Item 12 then is the uh, 
24-0468-HPC1 report by the Department of Planning regarding historic and architectural resources, archaeological resources in the local media. Any questions or comments about that? Otherwise, we'll move on to item 13. 22-0469 HPC1 discussion regarding topics for future agenda items by the Historic Preservation Commission. Again, comments made during this portion of the agenda by individual commission members shall refer strictly to proposals for future agenda items, and any discussion shall be limited to whether the items are within the purview of the commission and whether they should pl be placed on a future agenda item. No discussion regarding the substance of the proposal shall take place, and of course, no action shall be taken uh, regarding the proposal. I think, as Dr. Zebrand pointed out, uh, a couple of, of uh, items that this commission asked to be put on a future agenda will be coming up in the September agenda. Um, is there anything else that the, this commission would like Dr. Zebrand to uh, or put on our future agenda item? Uh, Mr. Chair, through you, uh, I don't have an item to put on, uh, just the old adaptive reuse, if uh, any more progress being made on that. And I, I just want to take a moment to thank staff uh, for all of the proactive, collaborative efforts you folks have been making recently. It's very refreshing, and uh, keep up the great work. Thank you. Let's move on then to item number 14, which is public comment during this portion of the agenda. And I see nobody in the audience unless, uh, is there anybody who would like to come forward for any public comment? Seeing and hearing none. Our last item is 15, adjournment. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Good meeting.